So why should you travel the world? Seems like an obvious question for many of us who have done so or are planning to do so, but many people are apprehensive, especially when it comes to more undeveloped countries, which can often be some of the best. However, many people are concerned about many things, such as the language barrier, crime, getting lost, unstable politics in that country, or maybe the people in that country don't like your country, people are afraid of animal attacks, getting sick or hurt, etc. I used to be one of those people, but I eventually did end up traveling around the world, so I'd like to help and encourage other people to do so as well. So this video is a little bit more geared to people who might be traveling on a bike or a motorcycle, but it might be useful for anyone. So like most people, I assume most countries were too dangerous and I didn't want to put myself in a bad situation, like being a victim of crime for instance. So for this reason, many of us will travel to more developed countries. Or if they go to an undeveloped country, they often go to a resort that's, you know, protected from the outside, right? People go to like, I don't know, Cancun, Mexico, or some resorts in the Caribbean and many other countries, but you're kind of in a safe zone there. Like many Americans, my first travels were in the U.S. and other Western countries. After I was in the Army, I hiked the Appalachian Trail, biked across the U.S., and then traveled in Europe and New Zealand. I didn't really consider going to places like Asia, the Middle East, Africa, or Latin America. They seemed like maybe they were either too dangerous or poor, or maybe there was such a negative impression of those countries, or maybe because they had such a negative impression of the United States. But there are many incorrect assumptions that many of us have. So the first thing I'll talk about are some misconceptions about crime. So for instance, most crimes against random people are pretty uncommon. You know, besides things like mass shootings or something, which that isn't completely random because the people are doing that for attention. But most crimes are committed by people that you know. So this could be an ex-girlfriend or a boyfriend, a family member, someone you work with or went to school with. And this makes sense for a few reasons. There's a big risk of committing a crime, right? You might go to jail, you could get shot or hurt, it could ruin your reputation, etc. So in order to increase your possibility of being successful in committing a crime, you need to make sure that you can take advantage of this person, right? They're a weaker target, and so you know some things about these people, whereas a stranger you don't know anything ab about, right? So for instance, so let's say you want to steal some money, and both of these examples are bad, but I'm just showing you the outcome could be different. And so in one situation you have let's say an elderly family member and you go to your uncle's house and you have you you act like you have good intentions and you know he has like almost dementia and maybe he's watching tv and you go in and you steal his checkbook or some money or some personal valuable things and you can get away with it now let's say even if he finds out about it or your other family members do they're less likely to press charges or want you to be prosecuted to like the fullest extent like you're probably not going to do 20 or 30 years in prison or get shot doing that. Whereas if you take the chance robbing a liquor store, you don't know the person behind that counter. It could be someone who would never touch a gun in their whole life. Or maybe it's someone who's like got the fastest hands in the world, like Wyatt Earp or something. And, you know, they end up shooting you. Or, you know, you only take off with 100 bucks, but you end up doing 20 years in prison or something just because it's considered armed robbery. So anyway... There's various risks of doing crimes, and so for this reason, it's not very worthwhile for most people in countries to attack a foreigner. Like, people aren't going to, you know, steal your bike and all your equipment, or, get, or shoot you, or attack you for no reason. And the reason why they won't is because the risk and punishment to themselves and their community could be much worse. So if they committed a crime against their own people in that country, sadly enough, in many cases, especially if there's high crime, the authorities or police might be apathetic, basically. They might do some investigating, but if they don't have a lot of clues or anything like that, it might just be a cold case. If you end up killing like a foreigner or something like that, the international press could get involved, the embassy, that person's family, you know, they might pull out aid, it could hurt tourism in that country, and many, many things. So there's really not a big reason why someone would bring so much heat and attention to themselves in order to commit a, a crime that would be petty or something they could technically do to someone they knew. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll uh, never be a victim of any crime. I mean, of course, petty crimes like 
getting pickpocketed or something like that is is common. You know, and of course your uh, size and sex matters. Like, would you rob someone who is 5'2 or 7'2 if you had a choice? And same thing with women, right? A woman generally is not as strong as a man, although not in all cases. And a woman, of course, is more subject to something like rape or some other types of crime. And there's also a difference between cities and rural areas. You know, rural areas, I would say, is generally more safe. In a city, there's much more competition, and if you fall through the cracks, you could end up homeless or become a criminal, different things like this. In the countryside, people are really surrounded more with like friends or family or people they know. You don't really make as much money in the countryside, but you also don't like fall to the bottom of society there. You're already kind of, you know, on the lower end of things. And also, it's interesting about crime because, you know, I was a novice traveling in Europe 20 years ago, and I was in a hostel, and the door wasn't closed all the way. I didn't think anything of it. And the next day, you know, I saw my, you know, my wallet was gone from my pants that were, like, on the floor next to where I was sleeping. There was only a couple people in that room, and they, like, we had hung out that night. It was definitely not them. So it was probably an inside job. There was a bar at the bottom floor. And so I basically had been robbed in one of the wealthier countries. So... I've, you know, places like Paris and London and New York, I mean, there's definitely really high crime in some of those places. So I, I wouldn't say like those places are super safe compared to uh, like really poor countries necessarily. So the second thing I'll talk about is that people are really afraid of getting attacked by animals, especially if they're camping or something like that. You know, they assume that there's wolves and bears like roaming at midnight, you know, in a hunt for human flesh or something like that. And I've biked like almost 20,000 miles around the world and hiked like 2,500 miles. And I've seen plenty of animals and no animals will ever attack you. It doesn't mean like you should ride your bike or wander through like a tiger or lion reserve or go swimming where there's crocodiles. But generally speaking, animals are not out to hunt humans. The only problem you're really gonna have with animals for the most part are dogs which also generally aren't a big issue, but obviously if you're cycling, dogs love chasing wheels. If you stop and get off your bike, they usually stop. Um, or if you bike into like someone's personal property, they're obviously gonna get uh, defensive. And then of course, rabid animals could be an issue, like a rabid dog or something like that. Um, but I don't think your chance of getting bit is so much higher uh, traveling than even in your home country necessarily. The third thing I'll talk about is the language barrier. This is another big fear people have. And it was a little harder when I traveled like, you know, 15 years ago before the smartphone. Nowadays, you could translate everything pretty easily. So before you leave, you could download some different apps with different languages and they're like 97% accurate. So that makes things a lot easier. And anyway, even if you don't have that, you really only need two major things, whether you're at home or abroad, and that's food and shelter. And you could usually find you know, a restaurant or a market or a hotel pretty easily. So that shouldn't really be a big issue. And you could also use gestures to communicate with people. Like, you know, if I didn't have my phone and I want to signal or show someone that I want food, I could, you know, use my hand um, to show like I'm eating out of a bowl or want food or slam my head to the side with my hands together like I'm, I want to sleep and people could kind of point you this way and it's kind of like Easter egg hunt you know you go over this way to find the hotel or the restaurant and so you could get around and that shouldn't be a major issue these days with all the apps out there for translation number four same thing with getting lost you know there's so many apps and maps out there that should help you along the way I think most people, especially if you're educated, you should have a basic understanding of navigation, especially if it's somewhere you go all the time. You should be able to figure out where to go even if you didn't have your phone. Um, I understand if it's your first time going to somewhere, it's much easier just to like put in the GPS coordinates and, and just have the map take you there. But that also shouldn't be a major issue. There's always good Samaritans out there and people in the streets that could help you with a place. Of course, not everyone knows English, but if you have the pronunciation or the name of your place that you're going, it should be fine. You know, if you don't have it in your phone, if you have, you know, most guidebooks have the place names and basic questions and answers you might have for like food, museums, hotels, and transportation and stuff like that. So that shouldn't be much of an issue. Number five, the political situation in the country and what they think of like other countries. 
So there's many countries we know of that are pretty unstable all the time. That doesn't mean you can't go there. You could still visit a lot of places that might be a little bit unstable. I know places like Peru, which I'm going next year, has a lot of political instability, but it doesn't mean you can't travel there. Now, there is situations where there's big riots or they're destroying you know, roads or railroad tracks and things like that. That's a bigger deal. You might want to avoid it if there's something like that. But most of their anger is against the government or something like that. It's not against tourism for the most part. Same thing with um, people's perspectives of your countries. Of course, I'm from the United States. Many people hate the United States, especially when Bush was president and we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan you know, almost 20 years ago now. So in that case, there's going to be people that definitely will be angry about your, your government more, but they do know that the individuals are different than the government. Generally speaking, of course, not all the time. Now, with younger like college kids and stuff, they might give you some more of an attitude about that. I had that a lot in Europe when I was there 20 years ago. But adults generally aren't going to give you so much shit for like what the politicians of your country have done to them or whatever. And quite frankly, although they might hate the politicians in your country, they probably hate the politicians in their own country just as much or more. So they realize that it's not like some countries have the best politicians in the world and there's just a few countries with bad politicians. Almost all people at the top of government are pretty bad and corrupt and you know linked with big business and other interests. So that's just how the game works. Is it too expensive to travel? It can be expensive if you go to more expensive countries. So if you're up in you know, Northern Europe or Japan in some places, you might only have enough money to travel for one or two months, which is one of the other reasons why I encourage people to go to cheaper countries because one or two months in, in those places like Europe, maybe you can go to China, India, Thailand, and Bali for six months with the same money. So if you want your dollar to go a lot farther, consider going to cheaper countries. There's still just as many amazing things, if not better in some ways. So number seven, you're worried about getting sick or hurt. Sure, you know, this is possible anywhere. If you sit home and you just go to work every day, you know, you probably could be more safer. Although they do say getting in a traffic accident happens, you know, most likely within a mile or two of your home. So if you're gonna travel by bike or motorcycle, especially by motorcycle, you know, it's more dangerous right? And you can get food poisoning or malaria and things like that. But, you know, that's, that is somewhat of a price of, of traveling. You know, you can get sick from food poisoning back in the States too. Is it a little higher abroad? You know, sure, you might get more sick in some little town that doesn't have the health requirements for a restaurant like, you know, the States or Europe has or something like that. Um, so, like, over the years, I've gotten sick a few times, but it wasn't really that big of a deal. Um, I wouldn't let that stop you from traveling. Now, the aspect of traffic, you know, that's the number one reason why travelers get killed abroad. It's traffic accidents. Uh, whether in a, you're in a car, a bus, or on a bike, or a motorcycle. So that's where you need to be more careful if you even have anything to do with it. Like, obviously, if you're a passenger, you, don't, you can't do too much about it if you're taking a bus. If you're a motorcyclist, there's some things you could do. You know, I would maybe know some basic medical things and some plans where, you know, how you would get to a bigger hospital because obviously little villages and towns don't have great treatment if it's anything serious. And look into good insurance programs if, for instance, you need to get medevac, which I don't even know if that's possible in most developing countries. It probably isn't. So what inspired me to bike around the world and travel the world? So I became aware of a lot of these things I'm mentioning over several years of doing research and taking like sociology courses in college and stuff. But I was still somewhat apprehensive because like you still want to know other people who have done this kind of trip. And at that time in like 2004, five and six, it wasn't like there was YouTube videos and Facebook groups and so much on like Reddit and all these things. There was a few blogs here and there so not a ton of information about people cycling the world, but I did find this one guy, uh, Heinz Stutka, who had been traveling uh, since he was like 23 in 1962 until, you know, recent times. So he had gone like 50, 60 years and traveled 378,000 miles, visited 195 countries and 75 territories. 
He's in the Guinness Book of World Records for like one of the most traveled people in history. So of course he had some adversity along the way. That's not totally unexpected. But there was a couple of ironic things that stood out to me. There was one story where he was leaving, uh, I think he was in the southern United States, and I'm not sure why he was hitchhiking, but he wanted to hitchhike with his bike and stuff, and I think he was going to my hometown, Buffalo, New York. And the guy was taking him up there, and during that journey, he told him to like go inside and uh, buy some cigarettes for him. And the guy took off with all his stuff. And so that was one time he got robbed. And then another time in 2006, he was robbed in the UK of all his things. He luckily got his things back. But it was really ironic to me that he got robbed in two of the richest countries in the world. And so it was like reading that and thinking about it, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do this trip. And so I set off you know, later that year and did a bike trip around the world. So why should you travel around the world? Okay, and this is more specifically if you're going on a bike or a motorcycle trip. So if you're biking around a motorcycle trip, you're much more likely to stop in little towns that aren't tourist towns. Because touristy places are beautiful and there's amazing things there, but you're not really going to see the good side of people. Because in touristy places, a lot of, almost everyone's really out for your money. Not everyone, but almost everyone. And you've got more people begging and trying to follow you around, trying to sell you things. It's actually could be really annoying, to be honest. So on a bike or motorcycle, you end up in this little town. You get to meet local people who often, if you're by yourself or with one other person, they might even take you into their home or take you out to eat or something like that. Now, if you showed up with a busload of 30 people, they're not as likely to take you into their home, right? <laughs> it's not like they're going to take a big group of people. So there is a benefit of solo or small group traveling in that aspect. And they might be able to show you some beautiful place in their hometown or give you some good advice. So those memories and experiences might be more fruitful than just seeing like the Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower. And out on the road, you know, you could stop where you want and get a breath of fresh air in the countryside somewhere where there's no people in anything. And of course it has negative sides because of course the weather could be either super hot or super cold or raining and things like that. Uh, so it can be isolating sometimes. But if you're on a bus, you can't stop where you want. You might look out of the window on a bus and say, oh, I'd love to stop in that village, but you just gotta keep going. And also you can't stop and go to the bathroom anywhere. So some of those big buses do have bathrooms and, and trains do obviously, but at least if you're traveling on a bike or motorcycle, if you do need to stop and go to the bathroom, you could do that wherever. Cause you know, you'll have some evenings where you're gonna have a, a bunch of drinks and either a hot pot or a bunch of spicy Indian food or Thai food. And the next day you might have to go to the bathroom about every 25 minutes and that's not gonna be good on your eight hour bus ride. So that's also something to consider. And it's also just a big sense of accomplishment to cycle around the world. Now, it's even a big accomplishment just to travel around the world by plane, bus, and train. I mean, traveling is a challenge no matter what. It, there's just so much uh, different things you've got to go through, different hurdles, getting visas and different things. But definitely being able to pedal up all these huge mountains, hit, go through all these headwinds and rain and cold and extreme heat. When you finish your travels, it's just like a, a major accomplishment in your life. So anyway, I hope this video encourages some of you to travel around the world, whether on bike or train or plane or hitchhike or whichever way you want to go about doing it. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe, and I'll have some more videos on this topic coming up. Um, some of the negative things about traveling, some tips for travelers, etc. And I have a lot of other things on my channel about you know living abroad in China for many years, my trip biking around the world, hiking the Appalachian Trail, fishing in Alaska, etc. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.